Hi, everybody. Hey. <laughs> okay, this is Read It Again Bookstore in Swanee, Georgia. And today I'm talking to Jessica Handler and Mickey Dubrow. And they are um, sequestered together in their home because they're married and they're authors. And so today we're actually not just here to talk about their individual books, but what it's like to be married to a writer when you're a writer. <laughs> so, and uh, can you guys give a little summary of your books so we have an idea where, what we're dealing with here? Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks for doing this again. Let's, you know, knock wood that our internet holds up. Uh, the book we're talking about today is in the camera. There we go. The Magnetic Girl, which is also behind Kim, better mm -hmm. lit than I have it here. The Magnetic Girl is the winner of the 2020 Southern Book Prize for Fiction. It's a finalist for the Townsend Award. And it is an historical novel about, based on the life of a real girl named Lulu Hurst, who lived in North Georgia in the 1880s and performed on vaudeville for two years. Uh, as the Magnetic Girl, or the Georgia Wonder, or briefly the Electric Maid. And what she did, there's a picture of, a real picture from Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper from 1884, showing Lulu doing one of her tests, which basically had to do with Fulcrum and Lever. She was believed to conduct um, magnetism and electricity through her fingers, in which she lifted grown men in chairs and threw them across the room. She worked on stage for about 18 months, earned a reported $250,000, and then one day she quit. And I just wanted to write about her. That doesn't work. I'll go back to that. Okay, there's oh, Lulu with her fancy haircut. Lulu. Okay, let me uh, get rid of this. She loved that haircut, oh, by the way. Mickey, can you tell? Yeah. American Judas. It's a dystopian novel. Uh, that takes place in America 10 years after they uh, changed the Constitution to uh, allow a national church. And the country has become a repressive Christian theocracy. And it follows a couple um, where the husband had converted from Judaism to Christianity, but he goes back to being Jewish and has to hide it from the authorities. And when he is outed, he and his wife try to escape to Mexico. And she gets caught and is sent to what they call a savior camp so that they can brainwash her to be right with Jesus again. And he makes it to Mexico and they spend the rest of the book trying to reunite. And it just shows what the country would be like if we became the Christian nation that so many people say they wanted to be. So, and it, but it's not, I want to tell the readers, it's, mm -hmm. it's not as depressing as you think it, it ends well. I'll, I'll cheat and tell people that. Yeah. And because I had to know that going in. It's it's hard to, it was a hard book to read, but Mickey put humor in it to make it a little bit easier at times, kind of like a little spoonful of sugar. Yeah. That medicine go down. Yeah, so, it, is, it is satirical and there is a yeah. lot of um, humor to it. Yeah. So, and um, in fact, that's one of the questions I want to ask you guys is your two writing styles are so different. Like Jessica, mm -hmm. you're, you're very flowery and, and like really kind of prose in your, in your, in, in your, in your writing. And there's just, a lot going on in one paragraph. And Mickey, you're like guts of it. I'm just going to tell you what's happening and we'll go through the scene. And so you guys, you have such different writing styles. What is it like to be like, are you mean to each other? Are you nice to each other? Like, <laughs> what, what? Mickey's a television writer by trade. And Mickey and I first met, actually it's our wedding anniversary this coming week and we've known each other for 24 years. And we met 24 years ago working in television and you were writing for... What, Cartoon Network? Cartoon Network Latin America. Yeah, promos. And I was a post-production supervisor and later went on to get my master's degree. So I basically write like somebody with an MFA. And you write like somebody who writes for a living. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and for promo writing, the idea was that you had 30 seconds to sell a movie. And really, out of that 30, you had 20 seconds. Yeah. So how soon could you get someone's attention in 20 seconds? Yeah. Tune in Tuesday for boom, you know. Yeah. So, Mickey, I bet you write a good, uh, what do they call it when you submit a proposal to publishers? It's got to be like a, a, pitch. a pitch. I bet you write a good pitch then. Yeah, I, I usually do. But uh, believe it or not, I need Jessica's help to really make it sing. Same. She understands what they want to hear. I know how to make the language correct, but she's the one who knows how to get the message right. So we work together pretty well. Um, which is good because I know some couples who one person is a writer and one person isn't. So hi, Rona. Hey. So one person is a writer and one person isn't. So there's that idea of like, why are you fooling around and not doing this real thing? And we both take it very seriously. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's going in her room to say, I'm going to write today. I'm like, absolutely. I'll see you later. We have separate offices in the house. We're fortunate in that um, early on in our marriage, we, we each staked out a room and said, this is going to be my lair. This is going to be my lair. And we know that if the person's in there writing, unless, you know, the, the other person's bleeding from the eyes, don't come in. Yeah, that was one of my questions. Like, what are your writing, like your ideal situations for writing? Are they, they different? They're the same? I'd say, I think they're different. Um, I kind of think about writing all the time. um, And, uh, but I, I I like to get all my chores done so that I can just sit there and not think about anything but the writing. And, uh, and and I think you take a different approach. I take a different approach. I um, teach full time. So I I, uh, coordinate the creative writing minor at Oglethorpe University and I teach full time and I'm teaching now I'm teaching remotely. Um, So we have different approaches to how we use our day Um, in a perfect world. And, you know, summer is coming. So I will generally write about four hours a day. Um, but I can't even get moving until 11 o'clock in the morning. So I'm good from like 11 to three. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, chores, they, they can wait. They can wait. I don't need to take out the garbage. I don't need to clean the litter box. What? No. Who does the dishes? The dishwasher. <laughs> we, we, we both cook. Um, and who empties it? Alternate. Okay. Okay. Um, how does it work? The person who cooks, the other person cleans up. Is pretty well, much that, how we do. That's the theory. Does not mean it's going to happen that way. No, yeah. it does. No. And, uh, and when it comes Aww. to emptying the dishwasher, we do it together. Well, if my husband is listening. <laughs> Wait, no, I'm pointing that way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, the, the whole reversal thing. Yeah, I, um, because I think because we both take writing very seriously as a job. It's not just this silly thing that you're doing. Um, it's one of our many jobs. And so, you know, we get what we call writer's head. And I think anybody on this chat and you and anybody, if you're making your art, whatever your art is, and you're deep in it, right, for however many hours, and then you're done because it's you're done or because it's time to make dinner or you have an appointment. We both have this thing where we'll walk around the house for like an hour and can't speak. It's sort of like, huh? And the other person knows that it's like, oh, writer's head, don't, don't talk to him. He's in writer's head. Check with him again in 10 minutes. It's like you used up all your words for the day and you're just out of words. Yeah. No, I understand. So we got a good question here. Um, how early in the process do you guys share your writing with each other? Ah. Hi, Rona. And Rona, thank you so much for the, the social media and the interview that you did. Rona's got this nice little graphic going on with writers um, giving words of wisdom in these times. Mm-hmm. How, how, I don't know. Uh, it kind of depends. Uh, we'll discuss what we're working on, but as far as the actual, it's like sometimes we'll read something to each other. Like, mm. oh, you know, oh, I yeah. did this and I'll read it to you. Not really for the other person to critique it. It's not till we're more finished that we will finally share yeah. each other's work with each other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you so edit I'll do this stuff? later in the summer? Do, do you guys edit each other's work or? Not really. I mean, it's not a situation where, you know, he'll send me the manuscript or I'll send mine to him. It's so funny, the idea of sending it when really the two offices are literally across the Pass it to each other. Yeah. I mean, you could just lean out the door. Um, but if you're going to send it to somebody that way, you know, you're going to read it and do track changes. So we don't really edit it other than reading it aloud and one person might say to the other, oh, that's a really interesting scene, but why does she do that there? Or is that the word you meant? But um, other than that, no. It's something that's very nice is like, you know, in the morning if we're having coffee together, one of us can say, okay, I'm stuck. Oh, yeah, you were so helpful with Magnetic Girl on that. Yeah. Yeah, like why I've got this going on. Why does that character or just, you know, saying it out loud to someone helps and being able to and, and knowing that that person's not going to laugh at you for doing that. I'm not can, in front of you. Yeah, say this crazy <laughs> idea. Like I got this going on. Does this make sense? And the other one would go, well, you know, what you're missing is this. We did a lot. You know, Magnetic Girl is, um, there she is again. Magnetic Girl is my third book, but it's my first novel. So I'd written two nonfiction books before this, and there's all kinds of reasons I did this as fiction. But I was new to fiction, and I didn't really know how to do it very, very well at the beginning. And Mickey and I had a lot, because you're so good at plot, and I'm not really good at plot. Um, we would have a lot of conversations about, well, wait, if this happens, and then Mickey would be like, wait, though, why is that character doing this? Or if this happens, what's going to happen further down the line? And I'd be like, 
oh God, you know, I don't know. So I've learned a lot about plot from talking to Mickey because he's really, I'm a language writer and he's a plot writer. Yeah. I think that would be the way to classify it. I love this too. Nobody's ever talked to us about being a writing family. 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 What about your cats? Do they write? There's one right now. Um, they don't write, but they love to walk on the desk. Yeah. Oh. yeah, they like to do that. Or right when you're in the middle of something, it becomes time to eat. Yeah, right on yeah. top. I've, I've got a very demanding dog. Um, and oh, I, we did talk about how you meet, met because I really want to, to talk about. So you guys <laughs> met in writing. Because I always love asking people. So how did you meet your partner? We did not meet in writing. I was, Mickey was writing, you know, for television, but I worked in a totally different department Department at Turner. I worked for, um, ooh, I, I worked, what did I, Turner Productions, just like out of my head, Turner Productions. So I was the post-production supervisor, which meant that I was in charge of getting all of our television programs edited, the sound mixing, um, the sending it out for closed captioning for the deaf, um, all kinds of stuff. So it was a very technical job. Um, I did not write. It was not a creative job unless you call uh, keeping my temper uh, creative uh, or meeting deadlines creative, but it wasn't creative at all. And we met in the cafeteria at the, at Turner. Well, we had, here's the thing. We had, we had met, but we could never remember each other's name. And this went on for years. Um, in the and, elevator. Yeah, and finally, a, a mutual friend uh, saw Jessica walking by while we were at lunch, and he said, do you know her? I said, for God's sakes, don't call her over here, because I can never remember her, <laughs> her name. name. <laughs> and he said, it's because you've never been properly introduced. And so he called me over, and he's like, something like, sit down with us, have lunch. And I was like, I'm busy. I can't deal with these people. And I ran off to my office. But at least he remembered my name, and we went out on a date like a week after that. So, yeah. And really what it was was he he formally introduced us, and he said, uh, and Jessica said that she hated TV and wanted out. <laughs> and see, TV was like my third career at that point. It, what I was doing. And I said, Oh, I, I changed careers. Like I changed my socks. So she took me on that challenge and had me have a beer with her to talk about it. Yeah. And so our very first date was like, how am I going to get out of being a television producer? And ultimately within like five years I did. And then I went and got my master's degree and um, I, I haven't really done other than consult since then. Yeah. Once she figured out that she wanted to be a writer, then she just went out and became not just a writer. So it's his fault. A great writer. It's his fault. Blame it on him, y'all. Oh, that's yeah. a great story. Gosh. My husband and I met at the masquerade in Atlanta. Oh, oh what show? Um, it was we <laughs> we met swing dancing. Uh-huh. It was back when, you know, the gap commercials, everybody was wearing khaki. Yeah. And we met we I like to say we met in heaven because we met on the top floor. So wait, you swing dance? Mm-hmm. That's how we met. I am jealous. I want to learn to do that so badly. Well, you know what? I really want to learn how to learn. I want to learn how to play the drums. Okay, we'll switch. When we can see each other in real life, because I play drums, I yes. can give you like basic lessons and you can teach me what dance will you teach me? The, well, the basic step for girls, I can teach you that. It's just okay. back, side, side, back, side, side, back. And then the guy does the opposite thing. Right. What Ginger Rogers said, I do everything backwards and in heels. Yeah, but can you teach me the Lindy Hop? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll teach you drums. I will. My, mine, it, it's easy to, to fake it. So if, if there's a music going on, as long as it's a good rhythm, you can do it. Okay. So. That's like drumming. All yeah. right. So there you go. All right. I'll teach you some basic like standard tables of time, and you can teach me some basic, you know, whatever. Cool. <laughs> Oh. Go back to my notes. So, um, oh, okay. So how do you guys deal with the different stress of like, there's a deadline coming. Um, it sounds like you guys are, are pretty cool with each other, but for you're like, oh yeah, I know the deadline's coming. So I better give Jessica a break or, or yeah, I know Mickey said that because this is due. Do you guys do that? Well, I think as far as deadline, we were already facing that in television. So we were used yeah, to we yeah. all hands on deck when you had a deadline, that everything goes out the window when there's a deadline. Yeah. You, just, you know that that person is just going to be gone until they get that done. Yeah. And um, and it's not a problem. I think one thing also is you got to figure that 
I mean, we were in our late thirties when we met and got together. Yeah. We already knew how to take care of ourselves. We didn't need the other person to take care of us. Not that we don't take care of each other, but as uh, emotionally and all that. But but as far as like you know, doing your part or whatever, it's like yeah, I, I I know how to make a sandwich. I can take care of myself. Yeah, I'll meet you when you're done. Yeah, or if you're um you know on a phone call with an editor or somebody, and I'm just like yeah, I'll just make dinner and eat in front of the TV or something and I'll catch you later. So yeah, we've been very fortunate in that. And we really work hard to make space for that with the other person. Um, right now, neither of us is on deadline with a book, although we are both trying to finish new books, but neither of them, uh, there's nobody like saying, you know, tick tock. So it's a little bit easier. What about your research styles? Cause I know there was a lot of research went into your all's book. Can I tell the story about the fence? Sure. Yes. All right. You can probably tell that story. Okay. The story about the fence. So magnetic girl, I'm very research. And there was a lot, a lot of research that went into this book. Um, so we went up to Cedartown, Georgia, which is where some of it takes place from Atlanta. We live in, in town Atlanta. And we went up to where I know Lulu Hurst's real house was, which is now basically an empty field. Um, but I know where it was. I was given a topographical map. The Historical Society showed me. So we went over there and there's a fence. And I'm like, I'm going to get in there and I'm going to go see where her house was. So I'm climbing the fence, right? And I'm not very athletic. And Nikki goes walking down the road a little ways and I'm climbing the fence. And Nikki's like, there's a gate down here. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's our research style. So he's more... You know, what is it, the tortoise and the hare? Yes. Yeah, I'm the hare and you're the tortoise or something? Probably yeah. so, yeah. yeah. So that, yeah, there's a gate. I probably do more internet research and she does more physical research. I do a lot of physical research. I go to places with Magnetic Girl. I had to learn how to do her tests. I did them on you um, or the ones I could figure out. Um, so I do a lot of physical research and you, but you do really interesting stuff with names. But also as far as research, like I did fire a gun to see what that was like. I did ride the the uh, subway in Washington, D.C. and picked up things. In fact, there's a part where uh, Seth hears a recording uh, while he's in there from uh, Freeman Wingard, the, uh, the head of uh, what's at that point Homeland Security. Well, I, that was just, I just took what Janet Napolitano oh, said when I was in the oh on know, the speaker in the metro yeah yeah about yeah. you know because of terrorists and being you know if you see something say something I just wrote down what she said and changed it to fit and it was eerily perfect for the book we were in D.C. because I was at uh, a conference and you came with me and I was doing a conference thing and you're like I'm gonna go ride the metro all day so yeah I've done that I love research let's see here we got. Hello, hey, all. Question for Mickey and Jessica. When you don't have a book in the works, do you still write every day? If so, what sort of things? I have not been writing right now because, as I said, I've been teaching full time, but I do have a book in the works, and my plan is to get back to it as soon as I deliver my final grades. Um, but I don't write every day, every day. Some days I can't, some days I'm not feeling it, or some days. Um, you know, I don't sit down at the computer and crank out my 1500 words or my 2000 words, but I might still be thinking about something or I'll get an idea and email it to myself or, or something like that. So I'm always writing, even if it's just a sentence that I send myself about, oh, what if she, um, yeah. I mean, I sent myself an email the other day um, that the, the only thing in the email was transactional which was a cue for me about something that's going to happen in a scene in the new book. But all I did was write the word transactional and send it to myself. So. And when I'm not, if I don't have a, a writing project that I'm on, I'm thinking about writing projects. And if anything, it's hard for me not to, I have like 3000 story ideas and I'm always writing them down and I'm always playing with them. So I'm always just playing with something. You're amazing. You'll he'll come up to me. He'll be working on a book and he'll be working on another book and he'll come to me and he'll be like, you know, what about a story where such and such? And my brain is just like, it takes me a week to write a paragraph. And you're like, here's a story idea. Here's a story idea. Here's a story idea. And I'm just in awe. Have you guys <laughs> thought about doing something together? We have. We have. We have. We did a, uh, a small film. To, it was a 48 hour film festival. And uh, a production company asked us to, to write the film for. Yeah, Superlux Productions. Yeah. 
And so we and a couple of people from Superlux, uh, you get 48 hours. And what happens with the 48 hour film festival for people who don't know is whoever organizes this, it, it, there's a like a, dro a drop, an information drop that says, here's the topic, here's the keyword, some things like that. You have 48 hours to write it, shoot it and deliver it. And that is not the kind of deadline I like working under anymore because nobody's paying me what they paid me when I was a television producer to do it. So it's like, nah, -uh. but we did it for fun. So we're thinking at some point we're going to write a screenplay together. Yeah. So maybe this is the time to do that. <laughs> and it would be, we're thinking the kind of like really tacky horror movies that you see. And do you know the Sven Gulli show on Saturday nights? No. Sven Gulli. Uh, um, what now? No, I, I remember watching horror shows when I was a kid, like um, USA Up All Night. That kind of thing. Yeah. Those kind of movies. That's <laughs> Vincent, from the 50s, 60s, like Creature from the Black Lagoon yeah. kind of world. Also, the way uh, sci-fi was doing uh, Sharknado and yeah. things like that. It was really over the top. Yeah, those are fun. We're kind of living in an over the top sci-fi movie mm -hmm. right now, so it might not be emotionally the time to do it, <laughs> but I don't know. And then it's hard to top reality right now. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to top reality. You can totally see the two of you working on a screenplay together. Vinay, what's it about? Give me a topic. Oh, Vinay pointed out last time, thank you for joining us again, by the way, that Mickey, you illustrate. You can draw. Um, well, I, I do draw and I do. Um, I, I was an art major in college. I have a BFA in fine arts and um, I was going to be a cartoonist and it, it never worked out. Um, but I still sketch and I still draw, but I don't, um, I don't do it to try to do illustrations. I do it just more for fun. But you're posting on Facebook, your sketches of who some of these characters look like, aren't you? On my, on my uh, author Facebook, uh, Facebook page, I uh, posted what a rough sketch of what I thought uh, Seth and Maggie would look like. Those are the main characters, yeah. Yeah, the main characters in uh, American Judas. Yeah, yeah. So, I have an art degree, but I can't draw. <laughs> what's the thing you always tell me? There's when people say, "Oh, I can't draw a straight line." There's no such thing. Yeah, no one draws a straight. It's, Unless it's you're an the architect. squiggly lines that count, not the straight ones. Yeah, no, I I really can't draw. So, but I can take a good pretty picture and I can put a nice display together, and that's where yes, I got my yeah. art degree. In. <laughs> you got a good display behind you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Do you do you like? The, oh, thank you. Do you like you like the book? It's over that way. Yes. And it's yeah. right next to the read it again sign. Yeah, yeah, which is a very kind of, the sign is very like electric company, 1970s. Did you do that? No, I didn't. I I, I designed it kind of. And then I had somebody who can actually draw, do it. I love it. That make it. And we're trying to turn that into a t-shirt because I would totally wear that as a t-shirt. I would yeah, totally, I would, I would yeah. totally wear it, especially if it were faded out a little bit. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you do that or I'll just run it through the wash a bunch of times before I wear it. <laughs> the other thing I love about the store is the wall that, that you that you have authors sign. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are on it. So the cute story is, is that um, who came first? She did. Jessica was here and yeah. then she signed the wall and then Mickey came and I was, and I Instagrammed you, I think. And I said, Mickey, are you going to sign Jessica plus Mickey forever? And <laughs> And he did. It was so cute. How could I not? It was, it was such a great setup. It was like, oh, hell yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, well, I think you'd have two women mad at you if you'd said no. <laughs> you and me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, you don't want that. No. You don't want that. You don't want that. <laughs> okay. So there was another good question in here. Um, oh, here. No, here, this is. Do you have any recommendations? Quarantine recommend, reading recommendations. Oh my gosh. Hi, Linda. Hey. Um, yeah, you want to start? Trudy. Yes, I've been reading uh, a, a local author, uh, Trudy Nan Boyce, uh, writes about a Atlanta detective named uh, uh, Sarah Alt, and she goes by Salt. And there are three books by uh, about this detective. It's very much about Atlanta, and they're just good detective novels. The Policeman's Daughter, Out of the Blues, and Old Bones. Yes. How do you find that? Policeman's yeah, Daughter. Let me look that up. Out of the Blues and um, Old uh, Bones. Old Bones. And what have I been reading? Let's see. Um, 
I just finished Julia Phillips's Disappearing Earth, which just came out in paperback, and it, it I, I ate it up in like two days. It's amazing. Um, it's about the disappearance of two girls on the Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia, at the very edge of Russia. And then in a sort of Spoon River anthology way, it takes you through different people in the area and their brush with this kidnapping. Um, I also, let's see, there's a book that pubs, I think today, uh, from Hub City Press by Carter Sickles um, called The Prettiest Star, which is just a phenomenal, phenomenal book. And it is about a young man uh, during the AIDS crisis in the 1980s who goes home to Appalachia from New York um, to as his life ends, as he dies. Mm -hmm. And it's a book that you th that's full of love and reconciliation and um, it's a lovely book. So I would say Carter Sickles, The Prettiest Star, Julia Phillips' is Disappearing Earth, and um, then I'm just grading a lot of papers. <laughs> oh my goodness. What's, what's it like teaching right now? You know, my students have been great. It's, it took me, we had about a week to get used to using Zoom and some other technology. And um, I'm discovering that teaching on Zoom is really um, neurologically tiring for students and for people. Do you remember this for students and for teachers? Uh, do you remember the TV show Hollywood Squares or the opening to the Brady Bunch where Brady you just Bunch. get, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's one thing to see 10, 15, 20 people in a room in front of you. It's another thing to see them in a Hollywood Squares kind of situation. Um, but we've all gotten much better at it and, uh, students have been all hands on deck and, um, it, it's hard for them. I mean, it's emotionally difficult. We have kids who, um, they're going to graduate, they're going to get their diplomas, but they're not going to have their cap and gown ceremony in two weeks. Uh, so there's, you know, there's plans underway to make that happen at a later time. Um, but the kids have been great and their writing is so good, particularly my juniors and seniors. Wow. So, but Yeah. So now I'm a, I'm a Zoom whiz, and I just use two Zs in one phrase. Zoom whiz. Zoom, Zoom whiz. That's a great yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, what have you guys learned about each other since you've been writing? He's did funny. You, like, he's fun. you didn't know that? I didn't know that, but he's consistently funny. I knew when we started dating that he was funny, but he's consistently funny. Um, you should see what he wrote on the grocery list in the kitchen just now. So, can, it, can it tell? Sure. Yeah, it says like lemons, wine, rice, coronavirus vaccine. Uh, yeah, he's funny. Uh, well, I always knew she was smart, and but I didn't realize just how smart she was. <laughs> and that she's well, she married you, so she's really smart. Aww. Well, you know, the joke I used to make, people would say to me, you know, she's so smart. I said, she's not that smart. She married me. Um, so I used to turn that around, but also just, you know, she's, she's very observant and, um, and, and very, and has a lot of empathy for people that I admire a lot. That's very sweet. Oh, thank you. And you know, it's, I'm, we're lucky to be in a partnership where we both respect each other's writing and respect each other's space. And, um, that's important to us. And I, I love his writing. I can't write like he does at all. He comes up with stuff and I'm like, where, what, huh? But, and then I read it and I'm just like, this is amazing. How did you do this? So yeah, I could never write like Nikki. And I wish, yeah, I can't write like her and I wish I could because yeah. it is gorgeous. What if we both did the same kind of thing? That might be a difficult, different situation if we both wrote historical fiction or if we both wrote, you know, trauma memoir or something, that might be weird. But since we write such different things and we appreciate, you know, we appreciate each other's work, but we're not playing the same instrument in a way, um, I think that that helps. That's, I'd be fascinated to see what you guys would write together because your writing styles are just so different. Like, would it be somewhere in the middle, like a little bit to the point, but a little flowery at the same time? Well, I think if you did it, there'd be two ways of doing it. Uh, screenwriting is one way, but if we did a book, you either would have like, and I've heard of couples doing this, you have two characters and uh, you trade off chapters. Yeah. Beth Ann and Tommy did that with Tilted Word, World. Beth Ann, Fem Beth. Beth Ann Fennelly, sorry, Beth Ann. Beth Ann Fennelly and Tommy Franklin did it with their book, The Tilted World, about the 1927 flood. They both wrote it and they alternated chapters and characters. Yeah. So. And so, I, I remember Nick and uh playlist. I think, I don't know if that's oh, the entire, yeah. but two authors did that and one did the girl, one did the boy. If we wrote a screenplay though, 
the style of a screenplay is so formal um, that uh, that would control a lot of what we did because screenplays are so heavily structured in terms of language and pacing. So that would almost be the engine that would drive us. Probably be safer if we wrote a screenplay. Um, I've had a couple people ask, can you talk more about your current projects? Hi, Libby. Hey, Libby. Libby's like, y'all right down the street from us, man. And I'm like, I can't see you. Current project, you want to start? Sure. Um, I'm working on a, a kind of sci-fi book. It's about a woman uh, who's uh, bulletproof. And uh, she was a survivor of a mass shooting. And then got, and it ruined her life. And then she got involved with a uh, defense contractor that was working on a new type of body armor for soldiers. And she was just a test subject. She was just, you know, disposable human. But she ended up becoming bulletproof. And she uses that power to travel around the country and uh, attack gun shows because she feels like it's gun culture that ruined her life. So now she has the power to strike back. Political satire again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what am I working on? It, it's really so nascent right now, but it seems to be taking place in Los Angeles in the 1980s, so I'm mining my own youth there. Um, and it, again, has to do with women and bodies and health and what is true and what we are led to believe is true. So the plot, I'm not real sure yet. Um, I am sure, but I'm not going to spill a lot of it yet because it might not work. But it seems to be about a young girl who becomes a wellness guru and things don't go right. Don't hold me to it, though. I might get, you know, I'm 50 pages into it. I might get 100 pages into it and go, nah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, what did you guys read as kids? That's what Everything. I Everything. Uh, Everything I read poetry. I was poetry was read to me. I read the newspaper. Um, I remember I grew up in Atlanta, and I remember asking my parents who Piney Woods Pete was. So if anybody remembers, was in Atlanta in the '60s. I thought he was like Yosemite Sam. It was a political column. Um, I read Stuart Little. I read Maurice Sendak. I read Island of the Blue Dolphins. I read Laura Ingalls Wilder, and then I got my hands. At the, when I was probably 11 on James Agee and Walker Evans, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, and I reread it every year. So, yeah, I'm that 11-year-old who read uh, James Agee. <laughs> but, yeah, I read, I, I read constantly. I used to walk to school with a book in front of my and my hand, like, on a fence. Um, so, yeah, all the time. And I, I was not that voracious a reader, but... Um... But this was a thing. I read Kit Carson as a boy, and that got me stuck. Where there were a series of books that were about historic figures, but they always did it as like George Washington is a boy, uh, Abraham Lincoln is a boy, and then it would take you into their whole life. But they would yeah. get kids to read it by starting out as they were kids. We and I became them. obsessed. And when I finally got to Henry Ford as a boy, and they were like, no more to read. I knew it was time to move on to something else. Oh, and also the SRA cards. Anybody remember the SRA cards at the front of the room? They were they were like orange and yellow, and you moved up to purple. Did, did the as a boy do girls like Emma Goldman as a girl, or is that me being a little lefty child? I remember um, oh, the woman who started nursing. Um, Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale is a girl. I know. Yeah, I read right. the, I read boys and girls. I was not. Betsy Ross is a girl. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's a series. I've seen it. Yeah. We I never still saw Villa Abzug as a girl, but uh, I would have read it if I had it. <laughs> Bella Abzug as a girl. <laughs> if she ever was one, I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah. The name remembers the SRA cards. Yeah. I got all the way up to purple and I was like, I rock. Well, I remember one of those cards was about driverless cars, and I'm still waiting. I was like, I thought we were so close to finally getting those, that, they, that those cards tell me about. Well, what was that, that um, ad during the Super Bowl with Dana Drage and all the Boston people about the cars haunted? The, yeah. the yeah. ghost car. Yeah, yeah, the ghost car. That's right. The cars haunted. Yeah, that's my mother's accent. The cars haunted. <laughs> yeah. The ghost car. It's a ghost car. It's a ghost car. <laughs> it's a ghost car. What was the other line for that, though? I parked between the lines or I parked 
I, I, I thought it was like I packed in Dorchester. I packed the car. I packed the car and then they took it to a place like between, in the, not in Harvard Yard because that's like an old joke, but it was like I packed it in Dorchester or something. I forget. I'm going to have to look that up because um, my Boston family is all deceased, but another, a friend of mine called me up later and she goes, they nailed the accents. I was like, oh, I know. Well, they're all from Boston. <laughs> they're all from Boston. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I'm not, I'm from here, but my mom was from Boston and I, I went to college in Boston and I worked uh, at WBZ, which is a TV station in Boston. So I was in Boston for off and on 10, 15 years. So yeah, I do not miss snow up to my ribs. I, I kind of miss, well, my family's all from uh, New York. Yeah. So I, I do kind of miss that. Let's see here. I think we answered. Did anybody else have some questions they want to ask? I will post them. Tell me who's here. I can't, I can't tell. Okay. So let's see. We saw this one. Oh, did we see this? No, we haven't seen this one. Does it, how, why does a book come on your TBR, my to be read list today? Uh, for me, I have a lot of friends who are writers. So I like to, you know, read their books and promote their books. Uh, the New York times uh, list and what gets reviewed in the times, the millions, the rumpus, um, I have a lot of friends who are in independent publishing. So whatever they're buzzing about, I like to support independent bookstores. I like to support small presses. Um, yeah. So I really like to know what's coming out from small and independent presses and what independent bookstores are hand selling. So very often, you know, if I go in to read it again, which I will again, I will again. And on so many of my other independent bookstore friends, I want to go in and go, you know, what do you got face out? What are we, what are we selling? Mm -hmm. And I tend to, I read a lot of uh, mysteries and, uh, and police procedurals. So I'm always looking to see what's coming out there. And I crime series, which mm -hmm. is reprints of stuff. Cause that's what I really love is that period. And my writing reflects that kind of uh, straight ahead. Pulp. Yeah. Yeah. yeah pulp. We have a couple pulp stuff in our mystery section. Pulp so, and, and I love the covers of Pulp Fiction, of Pulp books. Yeah. They're so trashy, but they're great. Yeah, like, the awesome. trashier they are, the better. Oh, yeah. And he knows yeah. all about that uh, that art and, like, how that, like how and why. Well, the thing is, um, I, I'm a big comic book fan because I wanted to be in comics. And so I mainly just read comic books forever. But then um, we went to the San Francisco uh, Comic Art Museum, and they had a book about Pulp art. And so I just, I used to buy the books just for the covers because you know, they were cheap and you could get beautiful, you know, really like you, the more lurid, the better. Mm -hmm. And finally, because I was reading that, they talked about the authors and I was like, you know, you could try reading one. <laughs> and I read it and then I was hooked and I started really researching those guys. Jim Thompson, um, Charles Williford, um, Harry Winnington. I mean, it was all these great writers from that period who just cranked it out and yeah, it was supposed to be trash, but they were great storytellers. And, uh, so and that brought you to Cookie Mueller and to, um, well, I, d I discovered somewhat Jessica found a book uh, that was a pulp novel at a, a yard oh, sale by a local author named Ralph Dennis. And uh, Dennis wrote uh, 12 books about a character, an Atlanta detective uh, named uh, Jim Hardman. It's the Hardman series. And they take place in the late 70s in Atlanta. And I moved here in 1980, so I knew exactly what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And the books never did well, but he was considered, he is considered one of the lost masters of crime fiction. And uh, a, a press called Brash Books has been re releasing all of Ralph Dennis's stuff. The book I found at the sale, it, it's, it, it's called Pimp for the Dead. And and I, I picked it up out of the pile and I held it up to Mickey. I was like, Pimp for the Dead. This, this is kind of your thing. And, it, and he's like, yeah. <laughs> I think about it. It's like, Pimp for the Dead, Hard Man number four. It's like, what's not the love? What's not the love? Right. Exactly. Exactly. I love he buys it. stuff like that. I buy things like, yeah. like outdated research books. Like at one point, I think I bought a 1930s guide to embalming science. Not that I'm ever going to embalm anybody. I'm a Jew, but it, you know, it, it's, it's in like, a book. yeah. And the language is really fascinating and the drawings. And then you're like, Oh really? So that's, yeah. I like weird books, like weird tech books that lead me to places in research that I wouldn't think about. You guys would like working in a used bookstore. 
we get some we get some very odd stuff and it's great i, I try to post it on the internet when we get it um yeah because we yeah. get the cult fiction and we get the weird um 1930s embalming type books <laughs> and, and and you don't try to judge the people who bring them in i mean yeah. you really try not to but you're like wow i want to know this person look yeah. at all this or <laughs> you're like wow i really should clean these books because you yeah and then the the the, the paraphernalia you find the, the, that you find in a book um what have it's you found in books we we found i found a 30 year old check once in a great gatsby for a hundred dollars and i found we found notes to people we normally leave the notes or the articles in so if it has to do with the book right. i just leave it in there for people to find or yeah. even i leave a bookmark in there um we found a letter to um an author of a different book in the book so we think at some point that the book belonged to it was a big name author i can't think of it yeah. it must have belonged to him because it was addressed to him and it was in a totally different book so like oh so he had the letter he was reading the book he used it as a page marker, page marker. yeah so that's fascinating. but it was one of those like dear so and so we would like you to read this book and maybe if you're kind enough to say nice words about it could yeah. you do that yeah and, request. It, yeah and it was shoved in there so we're like wow we got a book from this author how did we get that i bet they bought it online i don't know and oh that's so it. cool has yeah. anybody ever done a book that's like a, a collection a photo collection of the kinds of memorabilia or ephemera found in books I don't know. I know there's a couple coffee tables out there of favorite bookstores. Mm -hmm. And for a while we were saving them. And then when we expanded, we said goodbye to a lot of them. Yeah. Um, and then I was taking pictures of some of them for a while. My favorite is postcards. I love getting postcards. Yeah. And I collect postcards and I love yeah. reading them, especially when they're found. Well, then we're going to send you a postcard. I would love a postcard. I don't think I have a, po a postcard from Atlanta. I don't think I do. We'll try and send you one. Yeah. Because there's yeah, sort I'm, of a movement afoot right now to send people postcards to make them feel like the world is out there. So we'll send you a postcard. I I'll totally postcards. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. I love like antique ones. You buy at antique malls that, that are from places that I've been and they'll have yeah. like notes on the back. Like here's a hotel I stayed at. Yeah. I, I love that. Or these weird messages that are like, buddy's doing better. Don't forget the cheese. <laughs> 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 had a great time in Chicago. The mashed potatoes are amazing. <laughs> don't eat the pizza. Yeah, don't eat the pizza. Yeah, the deep dish pizza. Not having it. Yeah, you and I can't have it anyway. So there you go. Uh, let's see here. What do we got here? Author signed in front of the books makes me think. How you sign? Oh, that's so hard. Because you don't want to just write. You know, best wishes. If it's somebody you know, or somebody you like, or somebody you've got a relationship with. Um, you've got a good one you signed with, with American Judas. Yeah. Um, something about, you know, have a blessed day, you know, if, if you want. <laughs> something like that. I forget what it was. Oh, you Yeah, did what did you write in that? Yeah. Sometimes I just sign my name. Well, if it's a sign book, yeah. But if I'm personalizing it for someone, uh, my favorite was for, for Bernard and his wife. Um, mm -hmm. where I, they bought it for their son. I said, be nice to your parents. They bought you this cool book. <laughs> And speaking of Bernard, he he mentioned something in our last talk. I don't know if he's watching. Oh yeah, yeah. He if if you combine the plots of your two books, what would that look like? Ah, uh, so, so does this mean? I don't know, Bernard. Are you here? Um, does this mean he is. he's not? Does this mean that Lulu ends up in the world of Seth and Maggie, or that Seth and Maggie go back in time and go to Lulu's world? That's, I mean, right away, that's an issue. Um, yeah. If, if she, if, if Lulu was in the American Judas world, I think um, she would have to do the act as if it were the, the, the power of Christ and not magnetism. Moving I think she'd get burned at the stake. She would. And, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons that Lulu did in real life leave the stage is because she was, after a while, a, accused of or she says she was accused of i've read her autobiography uh accused of being anti-christian being anti-god uh, be doing things that a woman shouldn't do um and 
so in her era, of course, you know, looking directly at a man was inappropriate, being on stage was inappropriate. And then perhaps if she was manipulating science or manipulating the natural world, that's a inopportune or inappropriate thing to do. So one of the reasons she left the stage is because she said she was being accused of being anti-Christian and her father was a deacon of a Baptist church and she was, you know, a, a religious girl. So, you know, it's an interesting question because if she were in Seth and Maggie's world, I don't know how she'd respond to it. She was not a fan of oppression, clearly. Uh, and if Seth and Maggie were in her world, um, they'd go to her show. I think they wouldn't have even considered um, doing what they did. I mean, it's like, because in a way, in some ways, America was a Christian theocracy back then anyway. So, or parts of it were. So you would, they would, they wouldn't have had the freedom to do what they were doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting because in a way, what's happening in American Judas is that the America or certainly the working class, middle class America of the 1880s is being applied to contemporary, uh, to, to the contemporaneous world of American Judas because women stay home and have babies, husbands do the work and come home, you don't interact with people of a different race, different gender, different sexual persuasion, different economic persuasion. So yeah, so Bernard, I think you might be onto something there, dude. That might be your, I think he, he, I texted him, he's trying to think of it, but it had to do with X-Men, um, one had magical powers. I don't know. He said yeah. something ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, remember Lulu's powers were a hoax. Lulu did not actually have powers beyond the fact that she was physically big. She was probably about six feet tall as a teenager. Um, I think that she was one of those people who would win the staring contest. We all knew that kid in the eighth grade, right? She was that kid. Um, and she just had really fast reflexes. Oh, this oh, is Rosie. Kitty. Who's this? Hi. This is Rosie. Hi, Rosie. Sorry, I know that's mean to do that to her, but ah, so but Lulu didn't. She wasn't supernatural. She just was um, quick, quick and big. Okay. What are what are the names of your other cats? You've got Rosie. Hey Wayne. Hey Wayne. Hey Wayne. And uh, Alice. And what? Alice. Alice. Oh, we Alice. got Iris. Iris. Oh. Then I say hey, Rosie. Iris is a good name for a cat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alice is named for the 1920s song Alice Blue Gown. And I don't know why. And Wayne is called Hey Wayne because he showed up in our backyard and he was kind of beat up and homeless and rough and tough. And he just looked real country to me. So I just called him Hey Wayne. And he answers to Hey Wayne. And if you look at my Instagram, there are many Hey Waynes. So come to my Instagram and you will see him being a goober. <laughs> I would have his own Instagram page, but I think you have to have like 65,000 followers or something for that. No, you you, you got to start out somewhere. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I think having an Instagram page for the cat alone is like, I'm going to have to get real bored to do that. There, there's a uh, Netflix documentary about um, how cat Instagrams become famous. And it we was saw it. It's called Cat People, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Yeah, yeah my, really my kids, good. my kids knew like almost all of them that they showed, be, and they're not even on Instagram. They just were, they just love cats. Yeah. So, how did they know about it? Yeah, did I don't you know. See the story about cats getting coronavirus. With two of them in New York, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And a, and a tiger. Yes. I know. At a zoo. I know. I know. As if they didn't have enough reason to. Uh, to, to, to just be pissed at us. Now they have even more reason. <laughs> yeah, they'll be all right. And our cats are just hanging out in the house, so they're good. This is lovely, Kim. This yeah. is just like, yeah. And just now we have it. plans. You're going to teach me how to swing dance. And I'm swing dance. Mm -hmm. Well, the four of us can go out, like my husband and you guys, and we'll, we'll go learn how to dance. Yes. Sure. I would love that. We actually saw some swing dancing before um, King Sized. The band King Size, you know Mike Geyer and King Size? Before Mike became um, Puddles, Pity Party, um, he, the King Size was doing something at some downtown hotel, and we were just there having a dinner and drinks, and there was a whole swing dance group doing their thing. It was fabulous. There are classes. I know there's one at the, the Big Baptist Church down the street from me. They, they do weekly classes, and that you can go, and it's just, well, not right now, yeah. but it's a great way to, to stay fit, and yeah. it's just a good way to beat people. Yeah. 
So, and they're always, they're always short on guys at these things. There's always a lot of women. So there's a guy out there who's single and he's listening to this. It's a great way to meet women. When That's we get back in the world. My husband took dance classes because he wanted to meet a girl. And well, it worked. Yeah, apparently. How yeah. long, how long have you been married? We've been married since 04 or 05. I can never remember, mm -hmm. which I think is funny. Um, we've been together since 2000. Okay. Yeah. So, so almost as long as us. Yeah. 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 So yeah. three kids in a bookstore. Three and kids dogs. in a bookstore. Yeah. I normally have more dogs, but they're old. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, this was a lot of fun. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, okay, so let's go over it again. Everybody should buy a copy of American Judas and Magnetic Girl, and they should mm -hmm. buy it from me or whatever independent bookstore you happen to be supporting. So Read it again, you, books. Buy it. Yes, buy it. Sure. And you know, we can get it autographed. I have some of Mickey's autographed. I don't know if I have Jessica's autograph. You, 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 I did sign some stock, but it's been a minute. So. I think I sold them. Okay. Yay. Okay. Um, yeah, so read it again books, and also you, they can get to you through IndieBound and Bookshop, right? Yeah, you can. I, I have a, a Bookshop account and our website. You can buy stuff off our website. We actually have a lot of puzzles, like a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. everybody okay. keeps saying puzzles are hard to find. We got them. We got okay. a lot. Of them. I have a whole six foot table set up in the middle of the store with puzzles all on them, and they're all thousand piece puzzles. Oh yeah. Yeah, okay. I've, I've got them. Good. I'm about to load up four more puzzles to our website, but if you go onto our website, you can find the puzzles. I so. might buy one and have you ship it to a friend who's a puzzle fanatic. They make me nervous. But, I know, they uh, freak me out. They, they freak me out. But I have a friend who's she will only do thousand piece puzzles. So um, I might have to do that and have you ship it to her in Columbus, Georgia. I'll do it. I yeah. I have one of my best friends. She she does puzzles and she thinks doing the outside mm -hmm. first is cheating. Hmm. Yeah, that makes it harder to, to go from. So yeah, look, I don't know. I look at all those pieces and I just get really anxious. I'm like, you do it. I don't know. You know what I do like is paint by sticker. Have you guys tried those? They're stickers and you put them. In, it's like paint by number. That I like. Oh, that's oh, fun. funny. And then we have like there's like a book of masterpiece, so you can paint by sticker the Venus de Milo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like, like that. that. I like I that. that. At this point. I'm teaching, I've got grading, but come about May, I think, I forget what day final grades are due, but it's like the second week of May or something. And oh, after that, like, well, now what? Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm going to write and I might have to paint by sticker. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Anyway, and thank you. This was fun. Yeah. Well, it's always fun to chat. I like you guys. You're nice. I know. We, we like you. you too. And we look forward to, yes, dinner and dancing. Yes. Dinner and dancing. That sounds like a lot of fun. Before the end of the year. One day. One day. Sarah. Before the end of the year. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Have a good thank night you. and uh, buy lots of books. Buy Bye. lots of books. Keep your neighborhood independent bookstores in business. We love them. Absolutely. We're sending you a postcard. <laughs>